I've got a howling cold, sorry. <laughs> but unlike Theresa May, I've actually brought lots of mints and throat lozenges, etc. So I hope we can work, work our way through it. Um, yeah, you, you, I've got you in my company for the next 20 minutes. I have no idea how much you know about red squirrels and grey squirrels, but I hope that um, even if you know a lot, there might be a little bit in my talk that's new to you. And if you don't know very much at all, I hope that maybe it will inspire you to, to go ahead and learn more because they're really fascinating animals, uh, both the species. So um, the first thing, whenever you're talking about red squirrels, we've got to talk about gray squirrels. And the reason why this gray squirrel is looking so pensive is not because it's sitting on Angela Merkel's shoulder <laughs> or because Martin Schultz is glowering in behind them. It's because... I think it was probably about four years ago, a question was asked through um, one of these opinion poll companies, uh, essentially to the members of the public, representative samples, you've seen these sort of things before on the television, on the news. What do you think about um, killing grey squirrels, controlling grey squirrels in order to safeguard native red squirrels? And what we had in response was a landslide. 69% of the British public said yes. And remember, the majority of people who would be polled We'd live in areas where grey squirrels have been present and red squirrels have been extinct for decades, sometimes for over a century, because the grey squirrel first arrived in 1876. And what's it done since it arrived? Well, if you're a woodland owner, it's prohibitive to the management, the good management of hard hardwood timber crops because it strips bark. It does this for a variety of reasons. There's some really fascinating research on this just now by the Forestry Commission. A suggestion that it's a, a calcium deficiency and the animals are actually nutrient def deficient at certain times of year and therefore they're, they're, they're stripping bark to get to the um, phloem underneath. Whatever the reason why they do it, the economic impact is catastrophic. And there's a, there's a ballpark figure given here. You can pluck these figures out of the air, but we would all agree it is millions and millions of pounds each year caused by grey squirrels. They also have an impact upon uh, woodland songbirds to some extent, and they may well be having an, in, an, in, uh, an impact on the, the dormouse. You may have heard, oops, you may have heard that grey squirrels and red squirrels don't particularly mix well, and the reason for that, slightly complicated, but essentially we have a competitor here brought in from North America, it's better able to break down the tannin in acorns. So uh, there were some nice experiments done in the 1980s looking at this. Gray squirrel is super efficient at stripping ta tannin out and, and um, digesting the protein content in acorns, much more so than red squirrels. And therefore, they're able to use part of the countryside, the resource that's there in the acorns, much better than red squirrels, gives them an advantage. They carry disease, and this is what really going to be the focus of my talk for the next 15 or so minutes, and they outcompete red squirrels. What they're doing is they're actually having the biggest impact upon the young red squirrels. So the adults are, are, are maintaining their body weights enough to be able to come into breeding condition. They're, they're rearing young, which then wean, but those young, once they've weaned, do not stay in the environment if there are grey squirrels present. So although you might have gray squirrels present with, with uh, red squirrels for perhaps 5, 10, 15 years, and some people suggested that was some sort of coexistence, ultimately it's a one-way ticket to extinction because there are fewer and fewer young red squirrels to be recruited, and because the older animals live their lives and die, the um, adult population will decline, fizzle out to nothing. And then we have, <coughs> forgive me, these infections, this asymptomatic. Asymptomatic basically means they carry a squirrel pox virus. It's not harming them in any way. But the virus itself does harm red squirrels. And it produces the, the, the disease. I'm not sure if I've got a pointer yet. You can see this. It's a pustular dermatitis. Um, from first infection to death would be about three weeks. And we know this from laboratory studies um, where red squirrels were deliberately infected with virus that was taken from gray squirrels and then they were monitored in a laboratory and the pattern of, of um, uh, viral lesions was, was exactly the same as we see in the natural environment. So it was confirmed that this virus does cause the, d the disease in the red squirrel. But what else do gray squirrels do? 
And there's a nice piece of research published in the Veterinary Record in 2002. If you forgive me, turn my back on you. A whole host of, of different viruses. And on this side, I've written uh, just a, a short precy of the sorts of things that they do. There's one in particular that's really nasty, uh, LCMV. Um, I won't try and pronounce it. It's there at the bottom. And LCMV, well, that's a potential source for human infection, and it's a really nice thing. It produces symptoms uh, very similar to meningitis. And as you can see, about 20% of gray squirrels in that particular study had antibodies to the LCMV virus. So be very careful when you're feeding gray squirrels in your gardens. They don't just spread viruses to red squirrels and other rodents. So there, there is the potential for them to spread viruses to um, domestic animals and to us. Now, oops. Um, let me go back a bit. Um, Anglesey has been the focus of my research for the last 20 years. Uh, we, there was an eradication program. Gray squirrels were throughout the island in the late 1990s, and then through culling systematic control, they were eradicated. And what you can see in terms of woodland coverage on the island is an extremely patchy and fragmented landscape, but it's one which is divorced, largely divorced from the mainland by the sea channel. So although I think Malta is probably the only place in Europe with a lower woodland cover than Anglesey, nevertheless, it's 3% woodland cover on an island where we had a fighting chance to get rid of grey squirrels. And we did it. We succeeded. It took a long time. And it's a complicated story, as, as ever. And it's full of um, mistakes that we made and politics that we had to overcome and partnerships that we found, uh, landowner support. So there's great lessons to be learned there. And ultimately, we were able to reintroduce red squirrels. Okay? There was actually a small population in one forest that never died out. But to a large extent, they were extinct across the island. Today, it's the biggest and most genetically diverse population in Wales. Uh, Wales has about 1,000 red squirrels. Over 700 of, the, of these animals live on this island. And so, from a, from a Welsh context, it's amazingly important. When we um, removed the grey squirrels, we were able to document the pattern with which we removed them. And I'm, just sh I'm not showing this because I'm particularly interested in showing you culling figures, but it, it has a relevancy in a moment. And what, what we have here is number of squirrels, okay? So from zero up to 1,200 or so. And then time is along the bottom axis, so years. And we started off, if you can't see at the back, 1998 is when we started. This figure actually has 96, but there's no cull figures. So the first one's in 98. Um, and then through time, we were able to document the animals that we removed. And if you know how much effort you put in, how many traps you had running, how many days you spent shooting, then you're able to calculate a return for your effort, numbers of animals per unit effort. And you see this uh, quite commonly with fishing quotas. How much effort does it take to get, to get so much fish? And this is how they work out whether populations are declining or whether they're increasing or not. We'd expect it to become harder to catch gray squirrels as they become fewer and fewer, so we would get less return for our effort. And indeed, that's what we see. But ultimately, we have declines. We have declines in numbers and in unit effort, which is of significance when I tell you about blood sampling. 20 years ago, squirrel pox virus was hot news. Everyone was blood sampling gray squirrels to work out if they'd had the virus. And we did this through a test which looked for antibodies. And like most projects, we sent blood away, and it was analyzed, and we got a positive result. And that's about where we left it. Once you got a positive result, you know it's there, and why should you keep spending money to reconfirm what you already knew? So I collect, collected blood, and it sat in a freezer for, I mean, over a decade, some of it. Um, and then in the later stages of the eradication, a friend of mine said, I can get a freebie, some tests done for you. And I said, well, that's interesting. I've got some blood in the freezer. So let's have a look at it. And lo and behold, this pattern appeared. And what this figure is showing you is years along the bottom and then the percentage from 0 to 100. So these, this is the percentage of animals that show an antibody response. Antibodies are interesting because antibodies, the presence of an antibody does not necessarily mean the virus is still there. What it means is you've had the virus. So I have a cold at the moment. 
I may well no longer have the cold virus in my body, but I'll certainly have antibodies to it, okay? So I would test positive. Um, if you have just been infected, say by me, uh, your body hasn't had a chance to create any, any antibodies. So even though the virus is there, you would be negative. So bear that in mind. But anyway, we've got a pattern, haven't we? And that's on the island. So these animals are, are all dead. The, the remains of them are in freezers. However, on the Gwyneth side, the mainland side of the Straits, there are still thousands of gray squirrels continuous all the way down to London, all the way north up to the borders of Scotland with all the other gray squirrels, big mixing population. What do we find when we look at them? And what we find in Bangor, Gwyneth, so this is uh, a couple of miles from the Menai Strait, from the uh, bridge over the Menai Strait, really high levels of um, exposure to the virus in those grey squirrels. So, wow. Um, during the eradication, when we were releasing lots of red squirrels, we never had squirrel pox virus, and now we know why. Because the last few grey squirrels on the island weren't clean. They had not got the virus. And that's simply because they're never meeting another grey squirrel to be able to pick up a virus from it or spread a virus to it. In the Gwynedd side, of course, there are thousands of grey squirrels. They're mixing all the time, and therefore viruses find it easier to circulate. This is the Gwynedd side of the Straits. And what's this little guy doing there? This is a red squirrel. Uh, we never put any red squirrels on Gwynedd. Animals in 2009 started to naturally disperse across the Menai Strait. So we create a nice safe haven for them. And what do they do? They decide to leave and go and visit their friends. And there we have one of them. Um, and of course, we know, from, I've just shown you, that there's a high sera prevalence of antibodies to squirrel pox virus in these animals. And there's this little chap. Uh, in fact, it, um, depending on your perspective, it gets worse because, um, I don't know if you can see it, but if I highlight that little red star here, and it corresponds with the red star in the corner. So that red star there, that, that, this is a red squirrel at that location. And we have a blue star here. Whoa, that's miles away. That's about 15 kilometers inland near Beth Gellet. There's a red squirrel that's gone 15 kilometers from Anglesey through gray squirrels to go and live in Beth Gellet. And here's a nice female red squirrel. She's the green one. And she's, she's reproductively active. You can see, uh, you could see if you were close enough. She's got teats, so she's got young. So red squirrels, what on earth are they doing? Well, they've colonized Gwyneth, mixing in with gray squirrels, which means that red squirrels could pick up the virus from the greys, and a grey would never have to go to Anglesey because red-to-red -red transmission and dispersal movement of red squirrel back onto Anglesey, it's certainly not a one-way ticket. That fluidity means we have a problem. We don't have a full stop when it comes to the eradication. Um, don't tell the funders, because they all thought, wow, islands, easy, uh, finish, go away. No, it's not. It's really messy. And it gets even more messy, um, because grey squirrels can swim. They swim across the Menai Straits. It's a class one navigational hazard. But here we have a little guy. He's on his way. He's on his way. Um, you would think they would learn the lesson, wouldn't you? Um, a bit complicated, uh, but to simplify it, I just want you to uh, focus in on that, that, and that, okay? That, that, and that. Uh, these have reference numbers underneath. This is 2015. This is what they call incursion, okay? It's not reinvasion of a population. It's incursion. So animals moving on to Anglesey. They're not reproductively active, but they're colonizing. So 2015, three gray squirrels on Anglesey, all killed. Uh, and we found one of them was zero prov pre had a zero uh, positive, it converted. So it has had the virus relatively recently. Um, then we have these white dots. And what they are is where we chased shadows, where someone said, I've seen a gray squirrel. And so we had to go and trap and try and find it, and we didn't find anything. So we've got red squirrels moving back and forwards, and we've got gray squirrels that can get back onto the island. <coughs> You'd think it'd be easy to tell the difference between some squirrels, so we're going to have some fun now. And you're going to, well, I'm not going to ask you to tell me, but you can think in your mind, what have I just seen? And I'll tell you the answers as we go through them, okay? So is it a red squirrel? Is it a gray squirrel? You're on Anglesey. Remember, if you see a gray squirrel, you're going to phone me up. If you see a red squirrel, I'd like to know about it, but I don't want to uh, have to go out and chase uh, red squirrels that you think are gray, okay? So the onus is on you, and here we go. Okay, it's a gray squirrel. Okay, I think you all got that. It's a gray squirrel. Nope, 
It's not a grey and it's not a red. It's an American fox squirrel, highly invasive and on the European list of species of, actually these are traded, they were traded in continental Europe and because of free movement of pets, this is the sort of thing that can turn up in the UK. Uh, Defra have no documentation on movement of these sorts of animals. So there you go, we'd really want to know about this guy if he turned up. Oops. It's a red, it's a bit of a cheat this, but it's not the red. This is an American pine squirrel. And uh, the reason they put it up is even the BBC, when they're doing articles about red squirrels in the UK, Eurasian red squirrels, use this. It's the wrong species. It's Tamias scurus hudsonicus. It's half the size, but I've cheated. You've got no sense of scale there, otherwise I'm sure you'd have got it. It's a red squirrel, but it gets hard. Imagine you just see a fleeting glimpse and that's all you got. You know, what have I seen? I've got to let Craig know if it was a red or a grey. Um, it is well done, yep, yeah, this is that's a red squirrel, yeah, with the ear tufts, and there's another one, these are Scandinavian. So, you know, it's not easy, is it? It's not easy, you, you, you're sitting here and you're waiting to see this, if it just ran out in front of you, what would you do? You just see a grey, don't you? I say to the public, just keep telling us, even if you, if you think that you're not quite sure it's worth us going out to check. I guess what I'm saying is, you know, these sorts of... Um, uh, guidance to the public are all very well but in the real world it's not helpful because they've given the two that look totally different from each other and there's no sense that there's variation so what are we going to do about it this, this movement of squirrels well one thing we can do is try and break the cycle of squirrel pox and I was involved in a study um, I'm not a modeler hence I've cut and paste from the original paper and if you want to read that you can I won't even attempt to describe what the modelers did in terms of the mechanics but to give you a precy of what my objective was, I wanted a model that told me whether fleas were involved in the transfer of the virus between animals. So the flea bites or fleas are maintaining it like myxomatosis. And so the, the modelers did that. They modeled scenarios with and without the um, flea being a vector, okay? And they did that with gray squirrels only and then mixed populations, the two together and then red. So they're doing three different things and they're looking at whether the, the fleas are involved or not. And what they found was interesting, okay. Um, majority of grey squirrels, unsurprisingly, have got some form of ectoparasite, the fleas or lice. 69%, um, if, you, if you had uh, photographic memories, 70% is about the level of um, seroprevalence that we found on Anglesey uh, just at the beginning of the cull. So that's quite typical. Uh, level. So a lot of squirrel pox exposure and the models basically predicted that the virus could not be maintained without fleas. And that means you could do something quite fun. You could use insecticide application to try and reduce flea load on red squirrel and on grey squirrel um, if you wanted to. No, I doubt anyone's going to follow this up, but it's interesting nevertheless. So we looked at that <clears throat> and then in parallel we, we wondered about what other impacts are grey squirrels having. Okay, they've got the squirrel pox, which is a novel virus for the red squirrel. It's not exposed to this unless greys are there. Pox does not persist in red squirrel populations. They're naive to it. Um, what about altering existing infections? So this is stuff that's already here in mammals, and then you bring in tens of thousands of grey squirrels, and they start to pick up those infections, you can, get a, you can get increased infection in the native mammal because there's so many more bodies out there. The virus is going around really quick and it's constantly being spread. And therefore, the little red squirrel encounters it more, either from another red squirrel or from a gray squirrel. And we looked at adenovirus, and this is a real nightmare virus in red squirrels. This, is the, this kills them stone dead. And they don't show any external symptoms until the last couple of days. It's, a, it's an intestinal um, disease. And this is an electron microscope image showing you what they call micrographs. Um, this is a cell, and there's all the little viral particles. So this is an intestine, and this animal will be pumping out these particles, which then infect other squirrels. And, and so we looked, I, I looked with colleagues, and there's a couple of papers here if you're interested. Uh, one is, is new, uh, in mammalian biology this year. And we looked at this virus because red squirrels have it, gray squirrels have it, and mice also have it, and probably other woodland rodents will have a, an adenovirus. So in mouse, we found um, about 20% at most would have the virus. 
we now know from a German study this year that in fact it's probably a different uh, strain. So it's a mouse specific strain. And these guys here have got either the mouse strain and or a gray squirrel strain, but the mouse doesn't seem to have the squirrel strain. Um, so gray squirrels have it to a large extent. And then we looked, we looked at dead squirrels, red squirrels that have been hit by cars, okay? So these red squirrels have been killed by a Pirelli tire, not by some disease. So bang, a snapshot of, of their body condition at the time for all of them. And we find that nevertheless, about 30% of them were carrying the virus. And that means they're carrying it as a, as a um, what they call an asymptomatic. It's not harming them yet. It's in their body. It might not do, ever do anything. But if they were stressed and have, uh, um, repeatedly, then that could manifest into pathology and it could start to kill them. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we looked at captive animals. And this is, this is where we're going now. Adenovirus is the biggest source of mortality in captive red squirrels in the UK and all the zoos and the ca private captive breeders. It's a really nasty virus. So we've, so far we've only ever found the virus in gray squirrels in their tissue by using DNA, looking for viral DNA. We've never actually seen the virus in their intestine. But in red squirrel we do. We see it in their intestine when they're dying from it. So what role do greys play? Well, we don't know. But what we do know, if there's no grey squirrels there, we don't have to worry about the role that they play. And it's the same in Italy. A similar study looking at nematodes, where the grey squirrels brought in an American nematode, which is infecting European red squirrel. And the grey squirrel is elevating the frequency with which the native red squirrel has, its, has the typical native nematode. So reds are getting hit twice. A foreign nematode that's harming them, and then a higher probability of having more general nematodes at the same time, all because of gray squirrel presence in the environment. So how do we, how do we do get, get around this surveillance issue? Well, everything I've talked about so far has meant going out, collecting animals, tissue sampling them, usually taking spleen samples or intestinal samples. You can't do that on a live animal, of course. And we know that taking blood and testing blood for some of these viruses will not give you a, a really reliable indication of whether they're carrying them or not. And we've looked at different tissue types, so we know which are the best tissues and how the tissues match up against each other in terms of a probability or not of finding a virus. So, but we need to evolve things. So we've come up with uh, a novel idea, and it basically stems from um, a drug testing of people. You can drug test using saliva, urine, or hair. And if you can read it, um, forgive me if I go on this side for a moment, um, th th this is telling you how long um, the, the uh, test is, is, is uh, valid for. I mean, how long will there be a presence for um, in, in, the, in the various t uh, samples that you take? And, I, and we were interested in hair, okay? We, we thought, and here it says, it, it, uh, I don't know which one, I can't even read it, but uh, whatever drug that is, uh, it's taken five to seven days to show up in hair, and then it's present in hair for sort of, well, at least reliably for 90 days, if not longer. So we've come up with a new hair assay. We, we think we've got, uh, we've got, it's got legs, this, uh, so that we'd be able to determine the TB status of badgers by hair. Um, we'd be able to determine the TB status of deer by hair we'd be able to determine the adenovirus status of a gray squirrel by hair, and we wouldn't have to catch the animals. We'd be able to do a population census um, without having to go and interfere in the population, i.e. catch animals. So um, it's got a great deal of potential. Excuse me. <coughs> and um, we're just submitting a paper, probably going to Mammal Review, um, where we've, we've actually put all the, the statistical data and the different tissues and, the, and actually told people the specific method we're using in order to use hair. So let me just summarize the sort of stuff I've been talking about. Um, the, the, the gray squirrel will fundamentally change the system once it arrives. It's no longer just about competition and bark stripping damage. It's also about these viruses and how they're changing viruses and how these affect native squirrels. As we've seen in this yellow thing, um, the yellow text, Anglesey has demonstrated that there's no real end. The movement of red squirrel to recolonize areas with greys will continue and movement of greys onto the island will continue. 
And so we need to come up with um, better ways to intervene in order to have sustainability. And that might be Pine Martins. Some of you may well have jo read George Monbe talking about Pine Martins, or maybe and or um, an immunocontraceptive, <coughs> a non-lethal method of um, reducing population through sterility. And that's something I looked at in Canada um, where they were actually using this in invasive gray squirrels in Victoria. Um, and then these novel approaches to viral um, management um, could be the modeling, trying to look at things um, f from, from, from a new perspective, or it could be this, this new technique, potential technique of using hair in order to understand viruses. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.